concepts of whales that interest you as well as uh, that interest them. So, so it is not a formal setting, and um, we've given them cushioned chairs, except for Dennis, who <laughs> unfortunately gets the hard chair. Um, but please, um, do feel free to engage and, um, and ask questions. You can raise your hand, and one of the fellows will call on you. Um, at the end of this event, um, the library would like to ask each of you, or anyone interested, to stop for two seconds and repeat the words, call me Ishmael. <laughs> uh, and see the director for the, li uh, the library for that afterward. <laughs> Speaking of the director of the library, he's here tonight. His name's Matt Clark, and he has put together a great program. <laughs> a great program of art and science and literature. And uh, what, what better way to do that than to um, incorporate Herman Melville's uh, Moby Dick. If you have a cell phone, just uh, put on silent so we don't have to worry about that uh, while we're talking. There's a guest book for the Center for Coastal Studies. If you would like to receive um, electronic newsletters, please sign up there, um, and we'll let you know about other events happening. It is our 40th anniversary, and I say our because I do, I am lucky enough to work at the Center for Coastal Studies, but I am not a scientist. I just happen to love the work that they do, and I work with um, commercial fisheries, and I work with marine debris, and I work with the development office on uh, the special, and that's the cell phone that so was having a, a little trouble with there, but we have plenty of experts in the room. Let us know. <laughs> so, so at any rate, um, the Center for Coastal Studies uh, began in Provincetown 40 years ago and uh, this is really the first kickoff event of this year uh, for the 40th so there'll be a lot of other events such as a uh, gala on June 11th at Town Hall and um, sunset whale watches on the dolphin fleet and um, a birthday party with a sink the scientist dump tank and um, all sorts of other things so we'll be keeping you posted about that and if you um, aren't on our mailing list please do put your email there and you'll hear all about those um, there are five fellows sitting in front of you here, um, one, two, three, four, five, um, and I want to introduce um, to you the least familiar probably to most of you, although there's a, a woman named Barbara who knows one of them quite well. Um, so Robert Rocha is, the, uh, is from the New Bedford Whaling Museum and works on all of their education initiatives, and there are numbers of them, but the big event that, they, that he spends a lot of time on annually is their marathon reading of Moby Dick, some of it in Portuguese, or all of it. So there's a lot of um, history uh, with the Moby Dick marathon uh, for Mr. Rocha. But he also has um, traveled the world uh, to learn about the history of whaling and can respond to any of those uh, questions that you may have. Um, he's also in a rock blues band, but I don't know how that ties in with the whaling uh, research. And one of his um, steadfast volunteers has traveled from quite a distance to come to the event tonight. Thank you very much for coming to this. Um, next we have Philip Poor, and many of you may have known him as the person who swims every day of the year no matter where he is in the world, ah. including this morning at 2 in the morning because that's when the tide is right. So Philip is from the UK, but he is uh, at heart and soul a Provincetowner and spends as much time here as he can, um, often staying with our one of my favorite people, Pat DeGroote, and really just embracing the culture of Provincetown and its whales. Um, and he is uh, also a, a renowned author and has written a lot recently about the sperm whales that have been beached uh, in the UK and, and um, in Europe um, and has a lot of insights about um, that sort of um, unusual mortality event. Um, he's the one who came up with the title of this. <laughs> he, he wrote a book that's just out um, in paperback and it's called The Whale and it's uh, for sale here as well. Um, there's uh, several copies here. Um, and he's the one who came up with what I think is a brilliant title called From uh, Resource to Wonder, because that's really what the whales are to us. Um, Dennis is a naturalist, a conservationist, an avid bike rider. He lives in town year round. Um, he heads up the Open Space Committee and the Conservation Commission here in town. And he has been working on the Dolphin Fleet for quite a while and has a real sense of um, interacting with um, passengers uh, and being uh, around whales pretty much every day in, from now until October. <laughs> 
Stormy Mayo, um, I, I got lucky enough to marry him a couple years ago, and um, so he's, he's become part of my life very uh, fortuitously. He's been part of your life for 16 or 11 generations, I think. Um, the Mayos go way back in Provincetown. Um, his grandfather was a fisherman, his, guru, his father was a uh, master of tuna fisherman, his sons are shell fishermen and lobster fishermen, and Stormy studies whales and whale habitat and has uh, lots of um, history to share with us tonight. Finally, David Matilla is, uh, wor worked with Stormy um, in 1984 to disentangle the first free-swimming humpback whale here in the harbor, I believe, and he can tell you more about that. But David also um, um, has worked for the Center for Coastal Studies since then, or before, since the 70s. And he also um, is the secretariat to the International Whaling Commission, which is um, got a whole other branch to it than what we normally think about. He can tell you more about that. I welcome all of you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry about the standing room only, but if you do feel comfortable sitting on the floor, there's one seat there. I think another there. Please, two people, please come help yourselves. I'm going to go stand and take your place. Um, and I believe that is it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, I've, uh, Don't worry. again, thank you all for coming here, and I do say all, there are a lot of people in this all, um, and uh, I guess, why should I be here, except that she has some pull, um, <laughs> uh, I uh, was lucky enough to meet Al Avalar, so, uh, in fact, I grew up uh, right next door to him, and he uh, conceived the... Uh, uh, long ago, back in 75, he conceived the whole idea of whale watching in Provincetown. And uh, as some of us, I, a newly minted marine biologist, told him there was not a chance he would <laughs> find a whale. Uh, and out of that has grown the biggest <laughs> whale watching operation in the world. Um, I won't say much more about that, but I did. Uh, uh, I was one of the co-founders of the Center for Coastal Studies, and and. Uh, we have the good fortune, uh, just to identify her here in the audience, uh, my really my first formal assistant, who's Carol Carlson, and she's behind here. And Carol, uh, I should just say that Carol uh, is uh, is an authority on whales in very special ways. She's worked for the International Whaling Commission. Uh, she uh, is one of the people who communicates a lot with the United Nations, uh, has uh, uh, got her PhD up in Canada, and, uh, and has gone on to really big things, and uh, it's great to have her here. Uh, but I, I think it's not so much the whale watching part of it that I think uh, Dennis can probably relate to, but uh, we've been asked to sort of see the bridge between uh, Provincetown's history. Uh, its history is a, an important whale, uh, whaling uh, town, uh, and I guess uh, we'll hear a little more about that from Bob. Um, not something I'm knowledgeable on, except that my family uh, occasionally hunted whales. They didn't hunt them uh, in, the, in the ways that many of uh, the, the uh, stories come out that Bob will tell, but uh, my father, who some of you I'm sure may have known, uh, actually uh, hunted pilot whales, and he found um, he found that uh, he couldn't continue to do it. He, he I think he hunted uh, hunted them off of his uh, his small fishing vessel, and he uh, I think killed two or three of them. And he told me that he uh, had one harpoon and realized it was a it was a mother, and it was beneath the boat and he could hear uh, the calf that was still with it calling. And he thought, well, they are very evocative sounds. You, you've all heard the high squeals and squeaks. Who knows what they were saying to each other, but that was the end of his wailing. Uh, he thought he might have made a little money. He, he was out of the fishing tradition, but he really represented in some ways the last uh, that I know of of the whalers that was in late, that must have been sometime in the 1930s. 
or later, and so he was one of the last locals. Uh, I know a couple of other people who, uh, whose names will remain hidden uh, that uh, tried to kill whales, but, uh, but not, not, not any longer my father. So that's pretty much my background. Uh, I now study North Atlantic right whales uh, for the Center for Coastal Studies. And uh, I hope I'll be able to interact with Bob and Dennis and, and even uh, Philip and uh, talk about those things. Well, you're talking about your father. Wasn't he the one who gave you the idea about uh, yeah. some ideas about how to disentangle whales? So yeah. a lot of you know that that's what that the center began that in 1984. This is Dave Matilla. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. We, well, she did the internet. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> but uh, I just want to say what I've been doing the last few years has been um, uh, teaching, pe teaching people around the world this technique that was developed here thanks to Stormy and his father who gave us that idea. But uh, that's kind of my seat at the table. Is I've done a lot of international work spreading the work from the the, that the center's done and spreading that around the world, like Carol did with the, with the, um, Carol was, was really, is one of the per people that was most responsible for advancing qual quality whale watching around the world, uh, it, and it grew here out of province. Yep. More? <laughs> well, the, the only other thing can, I want to say is... Can you be specific it, about the, um, technique? Oh. Uh, let me let me let me, you let, me let me tell you. And then we'll go that way. But okay. but but that is true. The first whale that we found uh, uh, and and tried uh, hard to disentangle. I think Carol had some to do with that. In yeah. fact, uh, in the early efforts, and it was right out here at the mouth of Provincetown Harbor. This technique that now is saving whales, thanks to De David's uh, work across the world whales all over the world are being saved using the technique, but he and I didn't know what we were doing. Uh, and my father said, what the hell are they doing? <laughs> he, was, uh, he was the captain of the boat, so my father again had killed whales, and uh, then that day he was on the boat, and David and I were out in the, uh, in the inflatable, and uh, Ibis, the first whale we rescued, uh, was there and we had a rope on it, but we had had little idea what to do and my father yelled keg it And those of you who are local know that keg it means attach floats mm -hmm. And uh, that's indeed what we did. Ibis came to a halt and after a few hours we had Ibis free First we said what do we do now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Stop. Right. Uh, but yeah, that, that um, Interestingly we formed a global rescue network uh, based on those techniques, and and I just did a training in Oman, and um, I'm going to be doing a training in Brazil. The, the, actually, the my slides are being translated into Portuguese as we speak, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and a training in um, maybe in uh, Greenland. Uh, I've even done <coughs> training for the crew of a whaling ship in Japan. Really mm -hmm. But so that I came to the center in the in the in the early uh, in the early 80s. Uh, I was working on a little, I had a little wood boat and a sailboat and I was working with uh, humpback whales uh, down in their breeding ground and I met Stormy and, and he said, why don't you come to the Center for Coastal Studies and direct our Caribbean studies? And, and I went, wow, what are you guys doing down there? And he said, nothing. <laughs> so that's, that's how, uh, how I got started and in this, with the center. and. Uh, the other side of that, working in the Caribbean, I, I realized when I was thinking about coming to this and, and uh, preparing for this in a way, was that um, we've had a lot of influence down there and uh, the primary country that has the breeding ground for our whales, of course they consider them their whales, <laughs> is the Dominican Republic and we've, thanks to Carol again, we've had a number of young eager scientists from there come here and they've gone on to be managers of the sanctuary and and commissioners of, of their country at the International Whale Commission. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a. But you know, uh, whale watching uh, is an integral part now, of course, of Provincetown's community. And, uh, and that started up uh, at the same time the center did. And, and I thought it would be uh, important to go this direction and, and uh, <laughs> see if... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> see, see if uh, we could have reflections on that. You. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. I I um I wondered what I uh, I say here uh, to begin with, and uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to read something that I I prepared uh, last year, which I can't do any better than this. Uh, I timed it to about three minutes. Excellent. And it's called the Naturalist, which is what we're called. And it's short. At, uh, so I'm not here to talk about whales, but of people. I could talk about the passengers, but another time. I would dwell on the crew, each of which has a history, the captains, the mates, videographers, galley people. But for now, I'll speak about the one I know best, the naturalist. The naturalist's role is to keep a fix on the miracle to find it, celebrate it, focus attention upon it, and put all else in the background. Annie Dillard, new book out, Annie Dillard, said in Pilgrim Creek, the great hurrah about wildlife is that it exists at all, and the even greater hurrah is the actual moment of seeing it. The naturalist is there to say simply, hurrah, he or she does this in the context of the everyday. The passengers three deep at the rail. Bottled water at three bucks a pop. <laughs> the plumes of brown diesel smoke coming from the stern of the boat. The rough seas and lousy weather. The dearth of whales, even. The naturalist must overcome the drone of his or her, her own voice. The waxing and waning of enthusiasm and interest the minutia of data collection. The naturalist is like the high priest of whale watching holding up the holy scrail on the way out of port for all to behold. In the unwritten text of the presentation are embedded silver threads that can make the entire enterprise special or not. These may differ from passenger to passenger. Perhaps the fact that humpback whales, males sing, actually sing, and sing the same song and change their songs year to year. The fact that dolphins have signature whistles, that is they actually have individual names for themselves. The fact I learned last year that female pilot whales and some others actually go through menopause. That means they have a post reproductive lives because presumably they're important in their own matrilineal societies and on and on. Bertrand Russell said, the world is full of magical things, patiently waiting for our wits to grow sharper. <laughs> the naturalist at his or her best, important distinction, is a sharpener of wits, including his or her own. The naturalist must be as a child, must bring a freshly minted wonder at what is happening around the world, around the boat. The fact that we are so privileged as to be able to go out to sea to enter the kingdom of the whales even if they're not home. <laughs> Sometimes this happens. Thoreau said, this curious world which we inhabit is more wonderful than it is convenient, more beautiful than it is useful. It is more to be admired than it is to be used. I would only substitute the word love the world is to be loved. The naturalist reminds the passengers that we must love this imperfect world in order to save it. And that uh, pretty much sums up uh, what I'm here for. <laughs> And I'm here partly because of Dennis and partly because of other people. And really, I suppose my story about why I came to Province Town actually speaks to all the issues that we're talking about tonight. Because I grew up in Southampton, a port city on the south coast of England, uh, at a time when there were still ships coming up from the South Atlantic laden with whale blubber, which was processed in Southampton into margarine, into stalk margarine. So I ate whale when I was a little boy. When my mother kissed me goodnight in the evening, her teeth brushed mine with makeup made with whale fat. Uh, we played 
tennis with rackets, strong with whale guts. Whales were part of the economic discourse. <coughs> they, were, they were absolutely, and no one questioned that. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think what, 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 what this place speaks to for me is, is, a, is, 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 is a kind of portal to a, a new world. Because <coughs> the first whale I ever saw was a, was a captive whale, was an orca in Windsor Safari Park outside Southampton, uh, which was a dolorous place for a, for a cetacean for a human being, to be honest. Um, uh, and I remember, you know, we, were, we, we watched these, we went up there, my sisters and I were mad on whales and dolphins, you know, late 60s, early 70s, and we didn't know what was going on above our heads. We don't know what kind of psychic shifts that were happening in the world, actually emanating from Provincetown, amongst other places, but certainly from Provincetown. Uh, 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 we were just we were just fascinated with these animals, and and these uh, dolphins came into the uh, what was o an overgrown municipal swimming pool, basically, uh, uh, and they sort of we were all really excited, and the dolphins went through their paces, and they leapt through a hoop and balanced a ball on their nose and caught fish in their beaks, and I started to feel distinctly uncomfortable because this isn't what I was expecting from this this interface with you know the, the wonder of nature. I was a circus animal. And then the whole dynamic changed because the pool was cleared and, and a big black gate opened up at the other end and in swam Ramu, our other performer, an orca, a killer whale, the apex predator of the ocean, one of the most successful animals evolution has ever devised. And what did Ramu do next? He jumped through a hoop, yeah, okay. balanced the ball on his nose and caught fish in his beak. And for me it was a moment of apostasy. I had to give up my love for these animals because I realized what we did to them. Uh, and I realized my culpability. Uh, not just the fact that I was eating stalk margarine. Um, and uh, now I didn't know what people like David and Stormy and Carol were doing. You know, I was just growing up in suburban Southampton. Uh, all this was going above my head, you know. The notion that Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace was being motivated by, by the whole notion of, of the Save the Whale campaign, which now seems almost a cliche. It's, you know, uh, a fact, you know, it couldn't be more urgent now than ever, in a way. Um, and of course all that changed because of people like Carol, David and Stormy, but most especially because two rather hippie-ish scientists went off uh, uh, in a rib off the island of Bermuda and lowered a hydrophone into the ocean. That was the motion moment that changed. That's why we're sitting here. Because at that moment an animal which had been dumb and unable to protest its abuse had a voice, and it was not only a voice, it was a melodic lament, so it seemed to us in our anthropomorphic way, um, a threnody, and it spoke to this vexed meeting of human history and natural history, in which we sit now more, more urgently than ever before. So uh, it was many years later, the year 2001, I was invited to Provincetown by John Waters, I had no idea you could see whales in Provincetown. <laughs> in fact, I thought I was going to Providence. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and it was only the last day, and I was going back to get the ferry back to Logan from McMillan Wharf. I was early for the ferry, had a few hours to kill, um, saw whale watching advertised. And just all those old memories came back, and I thought, what am I going to say? Is this another circus act? Are they feeding them flounder out there? You know. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, I paid my $12 or whatever it was you were ch they were charging in those days, got on the boat, stood on the prow, rather arrogantly with my arms folded, saying, OK, show me what you've got. <laughs> Half an hour later, out in Selwagon Bank, 40 tonne, 40 foot humpback whale, well, breached right in front of me, like this messenger from the elements in which it lived, but yet showing its mammalian kinship with us, demonstrating that extraordinary connection, the connection between human history and natural history, hanging there, wreathed in a sea spray of poetic diamond sparkles, <laughs> Megaptera Nova Anglia, barnacled New Englander, this, this barnacled angel. Uh -huh. uh, and being a, already a practice writer, I responded with a very poetic reaction, I said, Fuck! Because <laughs> <laughs> there are no words for it. There are no words for it. Do you know there are? 
<laughs> you know, this town is full of people trying to explain what's out there. <laughs> and I spent all day today trying to explain to two boatloads of wonderful people, you know, six-year-old kids, elderly people, you know, how do you explain it? I don't know how you explain it, but it's what unites us. And Provincetown is at the, it's, at, like, it's the ground zero of this. You know, it is where whaling was practiced. Bob's going to tell us more about that, I hope. And then it's turned around with this intimate connection, science and watching. The passivity of watching. What do we do when we bear witness to these animals? We bear witness to ourselves. It's what Moby Dick, the whole of Moby Dick is about looking at human beings, you know, as much as looking at whales. And this is what we're looking at when we're looking at whales. We're looking at ourselves and our own values of what has brought us to here, um, to this point. Provincetown, there is nowhere in the world, I think, I would contend. I mean, Carol has traveled more widely and seen more operations than me, but for me, the, the implicit sense of New England's history comes to a point here. This, literally to a point, to long point. <laughs> you know, we are held out in the ocean in this place. Where we're sitting, we might as well be in the ocean. You know, I mean, how far are we from the ocean on either side, or three sides? You know, that sense of the vulnerability of Provincetown held out from the past into the future. It's like a kind of seismograph of, of, of our future. You know, that's what we bear witness to in this place because of what you people do. So, anyway, sorry, end of sermon, thank you. <laughs> Now we know why his books sell so well. <laughs> I'm actually going to stand to start. Part of the reason is, you know, why am I the only one here wearing a tie? Because this, this is a Moby Dick event, and you notice there is one white whale. Uh, so, and this is sold in the gift shop at the Nebraska Whale Museum. Red or blue, it has nothing to do with Democrat or uh, Republican either. Um, you just reminded me, to, you know, you, he just did the whole arm of Massachusetts with the unfortunate reminder that yes. New Bedford's over here. <laughs> 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 That's just, that has nothing to do with anything other than geography, I suppose. So anyway, I, I do have the good fortune of working at uh, the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I happen to be the science guy in the history museum. So um, the last five years, I've coordinated the Moby Dick Marathon, <coughs> which is how I've met Philip and Dennis. We also host the North Atlantic White Whale Consortium annual meeting every year. That's how I've met Stormy and Laura. And Beth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, in the 11 and a half years that I've that I've been there, I've had a, obviously a chance to learn a lot about not only whales, whaling history, human history, how whaling connected so many cultures together. And in the midst of all that, about five years ago, I was asked by the museum president, he said, hey, Bob, I've got this, 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 at, you know, this web address and this database, and he was really curious how many whales were killed by industrial whaling versus Yankee whaling, you know, the pelagic whaling under sail where everything was human powered. Part of it was to say, look, yeah, there were a lot of whales killed in the 1700s and the 1800s, but we weren't nearly as bad as the industrial whaling. Just try to tamp down the fact that even though the Whaling Museum does tell the story of dead whales and dead people, it wasn't nearly as bad as what happened in the 1900s. Well, two years later, I took that question and turned it into a paper which was published by two really good co by me and two really good co-authors Phil Clapham and Yulia Ivashenko. So we took a lot of data that I got from the IWC and Yulia who grew up an hour away from Moscow understood the Russian language but also was able to get access to data that some very brave men kept on these Russian whaling ships because they were all told to lie and they kept their own data. And I took all that and I published a paper, not a happy newspaper by any means, and I think it's part of the reason why that has to be here today, in case people are curious about what happened in the 1900s. Um, but I can say that whaling for as, you know, let's go back to the 17 and 
the uh, 1800s because that's what led to a lot of what happened in Provincetown, New Bedford, the writing of Moby Dick, the story about the Essex and the heart of the sea and all of that. And um, at least then Wales had, had, had a chance. <laughs> Um, but it also connected people from all over the world. And even though the Rocha side of my family is from the Azores, I don't think any of them were whalers. They came 100 years ago to work in the mills. And I'm guessing the Portuguese side of your family, I'm not sure if they came here for whaling or not. And I know, Laura, you've got some, you said Santos, was that it? Santos. Santos. Um, whaling, you know, it really brought a lot of people together and now <coughs> whale research, whale conservation, whale watching is bringing people together again for a completely different reason because I'm guessing all of you here care, you know, you know, you know otherwise you wouldn't be here because I'm not handing out beer, so I'm guessing <laughs> you're, you're, you're here for the topic. And, you know, uh, these, these animals matter and your voices and your help matters and what we do matters because they, you know they're they're the animals that tell us the health of the ocean and what's happening and if we don't take care of them we're not taking care of us I can remember several years ago I was at one of the very first National Marine Ed Educators Association annual c conferences actually it was the very first one back in 1996 and Sylvia Earle was there and many of you may have heard of her she was for a while National geographics oceanographer in residence published many many books she's pioneered many forms of ocean research and she began her slide I mean she began her show her presentation with the slide of the planet and she very simply said this is your life support system and that clicked in my head and that's really what's motivated me and now the fact that I get to teach thousands of kids every year through the science, because I was hired 11 and a half years ago to bring science programs to this history museum, to start getting the voice away from just the stories of whaling to now telling the whales side of the story and to get audiences of all ages, mostly kids, to learn about these animals and to understand that whaling's done, whale watching, whale conservation, and all of that is something all of us can be a part of. And um, so, I mean, that's why I'm here, and I'm also honored to be president of NMEA right now, which has really been a lot of fun for me. And I, ha I have to confess, I haven't traveled the world nearly as well as Dave, or any of them, or Carol, but I'm working on it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had a, a, just a thought as we, we've been hearing this, and that is that uh, I remember uh, uh, some, someone who I can't quote uh, said that scientists have to be good naturalists, and uh, and educators do too, and certainly Dennis mentions it. But the whalers were extraordinary naturalists, as I recall. Right. Uh, and I thought maybe maybe you or Philip or both of <coughs> you could address uh, how a good fisherman and a good scientist have both got to. If they're going to be good, they got to be good naturalists, or they don't make a living. I'll follow up on that if I may, Philip. Just the fact that um, back in the in the mid mid 1800s, a guy named Matthew Fontaine Maury started asking. I mean, whale ships, whale captains and first mates were doing this anyway. They were writing down latitude, longitude, mm -hmm. weather conditions, what was seen, what was caught, because the ship owners never went out on these voyages. But they wanted to know what's going on with my investment. And many of the ships had 12 owners, or 14 owners, or six owners, because the Quakers knew, don't put all your money in one ship, <laughs> spread it out. Because if one goes down, you still have the other ones where your money is. So they were keeping all the data, but then Maury pushed you know, for them to make, to really be c clear with their data. So now here we are, 150 years later, 170 years after that, and Noah has, come to the Whaling Museum five, six years ago, started to digitize a lot of these log books, and then now they're starting to mine the data out of these, comparing climate data from the 1800s to climate data now, because Latin Lodge is in these books. And it's gotten to the point where we can have volunteers, especially the museum's library volunteers, and some interns, 
sit at, at a computer and just start mining it out, filling in these different forms. Whalers didn't know they were being citizens and scientists back then, but they were. And this data is proving really important as we try to figure out what are we doing to our climate. So, so, so I was so going to say, I bet you, you know something about about the the, the details that uh, that these whalers. Yeah, have. and well, I want I, I think, want to say something yeah. too after Philip. I think what's really interesting, if given that Moby Dick is our pervading theme, is that Melville was drawing on two really important books. The first books published on 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 the subject of whaling, both written by people who had worked on whale ships. William Scoresby who wrote the account of the Arctic regions in, the, in 1821, which is the first real scientific account in the field. And Scoresby, I mean, his father had been the champion whaler of Whitby in, 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 in the Arctic, boasted of killing 531 whales in his lifetime. Um, Scoresby, his son, very used to these animals, became the kind of recorder of them. The other great book was, was The Natural History of the Sperm Whale by uh, Thomas Beale, uh, because all British whale ships had to have a surgeon on board. Uh, and of course, the surgeon was necessarily usually the most educated man. And, and Beale was fascinated by the fact that the Industrial Revolution was being lit and lubricated by these animals. These animals were supplying the, uh, the, the dynamic of the 19th century, yet no one had an idea what they were about physically, what they what they constituted, and, and Melville um, in uh, Moby Dick draws on these two books so extraordinarily closely that nowadays he'd be, he'd be sued for plagiarism. <laughs> uh, I mean, he bit, literally copied huge bits uh, uh, verbatim. Um, and that's the other point about Moby Dick, is, is that Moby Dick is the first time that anyone is drawing on, I mean, Melville is writing, of course, at the time of Darwin, He's writing in the lee of people like Georges Cuvier, again, a French scientist who was one of the first people to address the notion of extinction. Because remember, extinction was a blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Any other extinction other than the flood was a blasphemy. So when the notion of what Darwin was saying um, and, and, and what Melville is saying in the, cru in the kind of crucial chapter in Moby Dick is, is, is does the world diminish, will he perish? is addressing the notion of will these what we're doing to these animals reduce them to extinction. Melville, interestingly, says no, because the, the world will be flooded anew, and the whale will spout his froth defiance to the skies. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> so that might well yet happen. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and I think that's, that's what's interesting about Melville, is that he's, of course, he famously said to Hawthorne, I've written a wicked book and I feel as spotless as the lamb. He knew what he was doing. He knew what he was playing with, these metaphysical notions and these notions of, you know, the reason, the reason why throughout the whole of Moby Dick he refuses to call the whale a mammal, although he knows, and this speaks to what I was going to ask you that. Much more than anyone else, all the whalers knew, much more than anyone else in the world, what physiologically these animals were. What they contained was exactly analogous to us, that they were mammalian, that they were socially organized, that they were intelligent. You so know? they were avoiding it, they were, he by was avoiding by, it because... By he, calling them a fish, by yeah, calling... Yeah, he, because he, he didn't... specifically he, called it a fish with a horizontal tail. Because, and, and, and because your proposition is because he did not want to have us recognize that this was a mammal and intelligent? I don't, I don't think it's so much that as that he, um, I mean, what he's writing is a, is a, is a larger analogy for, for the condition of human oh, I venality. I mean, the, 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 the note, what, what, what Melville is saying is that the, there's, there's Ahab talking about this whale which bit off his leg and also other parts. If you read the book Can't carefully... Spoil it, maybe they have read it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a plot spoiler, spoiler alert. Uh, in fact, the implication is not only that his leg that, Mel, that I, I have lost. In fact, my friend said it should be retitled Moby No Dick. <laughs> <laughs> because what, 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 Mel, what Melville is doing is saying that the, um, that the evil which Ahab invests this animal with is completely nonsensical. You, animals don't act according to evil. They act according to instinct. There's only one animal that, that can be 
imbued with a sense of evil, and of course that's what Ahab represents. So, yeah. I would like to get a word in. Here. <laughs> I, I was going to make the same point as you made about Melville saying the whale will never perish. He even makes reference to the buffalo and how they've been by that time virtually extinguished. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he said that will never happen to the whale. The other point I was going to make uh, is that uh, the whalers were, were good naturalists, but not good conservationists. Uh, and the scientists, the 20th century scientists, in that book, The Soundings, that you gave yeah. me, working in the Antarctic, uh, were, were, were working for the devil, really. They, and I'd be interested in your perspective on this. They were they were what we used to call biostitutes. Uh, they worked for the industry. And they were interested in maximizing, uh, they were interested they, they were interested in saying, we'll never run out of whales. They would even say, well, look how many whales we have in this area. And someone would say, yeah, but maybe, this, maybe they're only there. Maybe they're just traveling there and they're not elsewhere. No, 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 we can take that number per square mile and extrapolate it over the entire Antarctic. We'll never run out of will. And these were scientists doing this. Uh, I, I can't name any names and it wouldn't matter anyhow. But um, science was sort of in bed with the industry. A lot of it. Not all of them, but many of them. And the very IWC that, that David is, uh, and Carol have so much to do with was a trade organization. It started out as an organization to regulate the taking of whales, so that we could always take whales. I mean, that's the that's the very basis of it. And just to make so that you know, I ju you just said scientists were in bed with whalers. Uh, scientists are now in bed with whale watchers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, oh, that's, that's part of the bridge. Yeah. Very good for, point. That's a very for good much point. the same reason in some ways. I mean, I, the the scientists back in the day, that was often the only access they had to to whales. Yeah. And, and we got started on whale watches because that was. You know, it was too expensive to own a boat and go out, so so it was access to, to get out point. and get. So of course that could get twisted because all of a sudden your your access to what you want to study is now dependent upon these guys continuing to, to hunt. John was going to say yeah. something. I, no, actually, what I was going to say was a, a, a question um, because it's come up several times um, in regards to the IWC and whaling it. Somebody could just say a word or two about what exactly it is that folks like David and, and Carol do for the IWC. Because we don't, I, I personally don't want to be lumping these folks in with the. I'd be, uh, well, I'd be happy yeah, to do it. Good, good point. Um, if, if you read the, the remit of the IWC, it, it does say for the conservation of whales, and then it follows with the. With the um, the, t the orderly uh, advancement of whaling, but but the majority of it is the only, as far as I'm aware, the only legal uh, treaty uh, to manage whales on the high seas. And um, the UN is not a you know is not uh, a treaty with 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 enforcement capability in a sense. And so many of the countries, there are 80, 88 countries, are are uh, members of the IWC. Um, the, I would say that the majority wanted to be focusing on the first part of its remit, the conservation of whales. Um, even most of the, the countries that still whale understand that that's essential to whaling as well, is, is wise management and conservation. And so what, what Carol and I did, I, 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 and Carol, you, you know, look at me, give me a nasty look if I get it wrong, but we basically um, saw the IWC as this treaty body with, with which brings 200 scientists from all over the world that work for three weeks in a row look, looking at uh, making looking at uh, well looking at the the Soviet data that came in um, and uh, and it was an opportunity to find common ground on on conserving whales and so that's what I I don't work at all with whaling I work with on, on common ground on other human impacts to whales. So mm -hmm. that's primarily entanglement, uh, ship strikes, marine debris. Uh, marine debris, exactly. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and in fact, I you know I'd be well. I won't go into what the the things we do, but 
but this little initiative to that has been in partnership with the center to do to build a global rescue network is is the part is something that all the countries could agree on that this was a good thing and so that's that's and Carol was working primarily with the whale watching the the sort of um, it's almost like the the orderly advancement of whale watching you know to she helped to 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 show people as they as they started whale watching in other countries what were the, the what were good um, best practices and, and what what was a good education on it what was what was a good link with with science and, and, and scientists to to make that whale watching return something to the whales and so that's I, I don't know if that does that answer anybody yeah yeah, yeah. And because I mean there's a at least publicly in the media, you know, the only time you well, really hear about the IWC. You see what you hear in the media? No. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there's that. Likely nothing. Yeah, it yeah, but there. that's what you, you hear about primarily and not the other things. Carol. I think there's been a real transition in the Whaling Commission, and I yeah. think that it, it came when, you know, people like David and myself and so many others, so very many others, realized that the only take is not to kill a whale but an entanglement is a take, and a ship strike is a take, and whale watching that is harassing is a take. And I think when that happened, we had a secretariat that was enlightened enough to be able to expand some of the subcommittees that we have. We have environmental concerns. We have um, anthropology. It's human-induced mortality human now. Human-induced mortality now, right. right. And, and, and watching. It, it, the and I think that that's been really a turn in the policy of the IWC that not many, many of the whaling countries like. I also sit in as a scientist um, for Southern Hemisphere for a catalog of Antarctic humpback whales that encourage people from well, even Ecuador now, which is not in the southern hemisphere, but to send, I mean, um, Ecuador. Costa Rica, not in the southern hemisphere, to send, send in photographs. And one of the photographs that David and, and uh, Dr. Duke Robbins took was matched to the Antarctic. And up until just recently, it was the longest mammal migration on Earth. So we're really learning in some areas to work together. And I worked there a lot on the blue oil research that I did, uh, that my colleagues and I have done on Chile. So we can work as a scientist and not be tied up with the, the whalers. But I think going way, way back, the one thing I'd like to say is when we said that scientists should be naturalists and, and whalers should be naturalists, I think the most important thing that I could say is that scientists have to make science tangible. And we do not make science tangible, not enough. Um, there are <coughs> some very important issues that we can all name and not have more than a few minute discussion about. So I think that if we really have a big role now, we have a lot of science in our back pocket. It's a basis for policy. And I think it's up to us to make it tangible. Yeah. Excellent. Another hand. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, oh, go ahead. yeah. No, no, go. Oh, I, if you could all speak, or anybody in the panel speak to what is the current status of whale hunting still in the world and the countries that are involved and how, how they justify continuing to do this in the face of <laughs> what we just talked about? Well, you would think that I would know that. And I'll give you an answer. But I, I actually, I mean, when the video's on, but. Um, I have tried to stay away from the whaling issue because I've tr been trying to build common ground with countries. And that's why the, the, the countries that had, that moved forward this initiative on entanglement, and I would say that more whales die from entanglement every year than whaling. Um, that, that was Norway, the U.S., and Australia. So the kind of the two poles of the, of the whaling and anti-whaling in the U.S. is somewhere in the middle because we have the subsistence. But, uh, Norway has a, um, a, a quota that they, for Mickey whales that they give to themselves because they objected at the moratorium because they felt that they had enough Mickey whales and enough science to, to back up that. So they, they, I think it's about four or five hundred a year, I believe. Right? Um, <coughs> uh, Japan is using the, sci the uh, scientific whaling. 
Rem remember that, I mean, we can, using we can talk. Using yeah. the excuse of saying Well, that. well, though, remember, this okay. This goes back to the question. He can't say it. No, no, no. This goes back, I, I, this goes back to that, that question about, well, why were there biologists on the whaling boats? It was the only access. And back when the moratorium was, was signed, um, most of the biologists were still whale boat whaling biologists. They're like, well, how are we going to know if the populations are, you know, increasing, decreasing, or what's going on? So there was this little loophole that the, I believe the United States, uh, uh, I was just told recently, insisted on, that there be countries going to permit, that give themselves a permit to hunt a certain number of whales to examine the reproductive this and that and to figure out whether the population was recovering. Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, Japan is using that as a, uh, a loophole to continue whaling. Um, and then the Iceland is whaling under, I think under objection, but uh, those are the commercial hunts, basically. And then the, as there's subsistence hunts, uh, aboriginal hunts in Greenland and uh, all, uh, actually that's, well, in Greenland, in uh, the US, in Alaska, and um, in uh, Russia, the Arctic, Russian Arctic, and, in, and in, um, the Beckley in the Caribbean. Um, but as I said, more whales are being killed by in, entanglement in, in fishing gear. And it's a long, painful death for most of them. So that's, it's something to just, you know, it's not, but it's different, it's not intentional. You know, so it's, it's a very different thing. And, and we eat the fish that are caught. Yeah. We eat the fish, so we're all involved. Yeah. Carol, uh, Carol had a, a yeah. to that. Carol? Yeah, I just want, oh no, no, that okay. was precise. I just okay. wanted to say that when the schedule was written initially, those things that should have been considered loopholes were actually written into the schedule of the IWC. So most of them, which were loopholes, are no longer loopholes. They are part of the convention. By breaking them on scientific whaling like Japan does, I mean, what we say to Japan is, what it says is that we have to have, it has to have a management issue. And to be a management issue and to be correct, it has to be statistically significant. And they have had no catches that have been enough, they've been plenty, but not enough <coughs> to show stati statistical significance or management. So it's really in defiance, it's in bad spirit, basically. But unfortunately, without everybody voting to get rid of them, they're going to stay on the schedule. And that's why it's been so hard to get rid of some of this. Although they were taken, Australia took them to court at the World Court in The Hague, and they lost. Uh, uh, Australia won them, and right. Japan and lost. Still up there really. However, it was <laughs> what what most people don't know is that it was just that they were just looking at that particular right. proposal for that particular research. So right. the Japanese said they won because they just go back and change, you know, they improve made their research. research. Yeah. But anyway, that, yeah. I think that's more detailed. Well, I'm going to add, you know, I think one of the parts of our Article Eight of the International Convention on the Regulation whaling that drives people nuts is the fact that it says if you do scientific whaling once you're done with the whales you have to do something with the whales and what Japan is choosing to do is to package them eat them you know school the you know whatever it is and I know, you know a lot of folks find that un unpalatable not to be punny mm -hmm. um, and then I guess the you know the other issue seems to be I don't think they've published anything yet in a scientifically peer reviewed journal out of all the all of, out of all of the research that they've done. A lot of folks have a problem with that. I think the only tiny bit of information that's been useful is they're the ones that collected the sample, the DNA samples to confirm the Omuras whale. I think that's how we found out that it's a separate species. But I think that was an accidental discovery. <laughs> So we have 14 species of baleen whale. So I, you know, I, I want to know from you, Philip, uh, how you see the bridge, uh, because that's one of the reasons we're here. It is Provincetown in one fashion or another. And I, I Bob, this, how good a whale Sorry. before that? How, how important was Provincetown? It did at one point. Uh, uh, have a fair amount of whaling. Uh, is that not right? Sure. Uh -huh. did, did everybody see the um, article in the banner the from the Advocate Archives about Finback and humpback, humpbacks being hunted here 
in 1880. Did you all see that? It was on two weeks ago in paper. I guess they had about 10 finbacks captured in the past few weeks. So maybe that's sort of an indicator of the number, you know, a typical number um, per month. So that which which is. kind of whales were caught here in Provincetown? I mean, now we catch uh, humpbacks and fin whales off of whale watching boats. That's Ooh. mainly what was caught then. Was that the same? Well, I just finished a great book that I got at Bob's <laughs> museum bookstore called Cape Cod Shore Whaling. And of course, um, from in the 1600s, uh, whaling was, uh, there were drift whales. They called them drift whales, which were uh, beached whales. And it, it boggles our mind that there must have been so many whales, that there were so many that would naturally, not because of any human activity, would beach themselves. So people made use of them. The Native Americans made use of them. The early colonists did. Then they began going up and down in boats looking for drift whales. That sort of progressed into, hey, we're out here, there's a whale, let's stick it. But uh, this was shore whaling. But that's before New Bedford, before offshore whaling. Um, and it also said in this book that virtually every man was involved in some aspect of whaling. You might have a, a little farm, you might fish. Right. Uh, a lot of the schooners would convert from fishing to whaling. Um, you yeah, know, that's what my family did. Yeah. My family took whales. They were mackerel fishermen. Yeah. Or you might and be they a, took a whale. They would took a, take, took a whale if it happened to swim by. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we had we had watchtowers just like they have in Portugal. Uh, mm -hmm. To see when the whales were in the bay, they'd go get them. Uh, you have to think about coopers, which were uh, making the barrels because the oil had to go into barrels. They denuded the cape, um, for, among many reasons, right. chopped down all the wood to make yeah. barrels and uh, hoops for the barrels, so it was all connected, but I'm sure you know more. But that was all just local down-home whaling, not not the Moby Dick kind of whaling. What, what kind of whaling what did Provincetown do? It was only just local, just in the area? Yeah, I don't know that too many ships from this town went on those two, three, uh, the long four ones. year journeys. Oh, there was a funny little term they used. John, did you want to? No, no, go finish what you were going to yeah, say. Okay. First. You know, I'm obviously first more um, familiar with uh, uh, the New Bedford voyages. Yeah. And I think, and a lot of that had to do with the Quaker influence of being willing to put that much money into a <coughs> ship to send it out two, three, four years, send it around Cape Horn, out into the Pacific, as we started knocking down the populations in the North Atlantic, South. I think, no, just to go back, by the time New Bedford was really a notable whaling port and was sending ships out in the 1780s, 1790s, they weren't spending any time going after North Atlantic right whales because those populations had already dropped. The bass had gotten to those and other folks. So they went sperm whales and then southern right whales and then, you know, around into the uh, Pacific. But, m you know, my, my understanding of the whaling done from here and I wish I could remember the great term they had for the whale the voyages that lasted a few weeks. Elder puff or something that's like it, that. Yeah, I think that's that it. it. Yeah. What was it? Capture what? <coughs> it was powder. 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 Something like that. John, it was in the book you gave. The, the thing I was going that log book, yeah. yeah. No, the, the thing I was gonna mention in that regard was when we, we look back on on more historic whaling, we kind of oftentimes oversimplify it into looking for oil. Not a whole lot of thought or, or commentary is put into the, the um, edible aspects of it, um, which would have been of a, a lesser economic value. Um, but when we think of fishing, we tend to think of it in terms of the edible aspects of it. Um, but when you go back to the, to the mid-late 1800s, so to get back to your original question, Stormy, um, an awful lot of things like herring fishing, things like that, was for oil. Mm -hmm. That's what they were going after those fish for. And because the, the boats and the, the shore-based um, support systems for those boats, um, okay, whaling is definitely a different technique than, than fishing, especially for those types of fish. 
given that the end product is fairly similar, when one particular fish were more difficult, they could relatively easily make that transition and go back and forth. And, and many of those ships in the mid-late 1800s were able to do that. And the transition has been made between disentanglement, similar techniques, similar systems, yeah. Yeah. and now whale watching. Yeah. Really, in many respects, the same sort of thing. I think what is also to widen it a little bit is to think what whaling also brought back was what it brought back from the world to places like this, and what would, what was taken from this place to the rest of the world. The fact that you know, 64 percent of the eastern seaboard population of Massachusetts have Azorian or Portuguese blood. Um, the relationship to people of um, of of other races generally. Um, which is why you know Moby Dick speaks to that sense of this transforming world, which is being transformed by the economic power of whaling, uh, most especially you know by the uh, the American and British whaling fleets. I mean the the, develop, the whole development of the uh, the, the, the South Pacific, um, the opening up of, of of those colonies. I mean the. It, we in Britain established a penal colony in, in New South Wales, but it could only be supplied by whaling ships. It was only maintained. They weren't self-sufficient in in, 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 in in food. They were being supplied from Britain by whaling ships. You know, New Zealand, um, Tasmania, these places were, were founded on whaling. Uh, and what that brings back, you know, from, from the point of view of America as a new imperial power, which is what Melville satirizing and, 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 and create, drawing analogies with, with a country which is dysfunctional, which is uh, enslaving people. Um, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's, no, it's no coincidence, it's a white whale. Um, it's the, 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 all those, those things, and, and it's the sense of, um, you know, this, 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 this extraordinary, and it's what we live with now, because it's, a lot of it is to do with the, is the sep and I, this is really true to what we're talking about now, it's the separation of art from science, from the notion of this kind of the, the Renaissance man who, was, who could be anything, you know, someone like Tom, uh, uh, Isaac Newton who believed in alchemy as well as discovering gravity. gravity. The notion that uh, in, in the early Victorian period, the, the, the scientist was a polymath who bridge disciplines. It's that crucial schism of disciplines which has created the world that we live with now. I mean, that, that's really, and that's, um, Melville speaks to that, and Whaling speaks to that. Um, so it's, it, these things have a, a huge effect uh, on that, and, and that's, a, that's what I find fascinating about Provincetown is a microcosm of that. You know, this place which is very held out to the world, it's held out from America's corpus, it's held out there, it's, it's receiving in, you know, other influences. I mean, it's kind of, that's what sort of transmitted back from sort of infects America in a way. Um, so it's that sensibility of this exchange for the plunder of the natural environment, which America and Britain undertake in the 19th century between us, we really fuck up the world. I'm sorry, but we do. <coughs> Your words. Uh, and yeah, and, and, and what's the world sitting there? There is no other animal, as far as I know, which so is heavily freighted with that sense of dysfunction. And it, it's, le it's this, you know, the greatest animal on earth. No one's ever seen it. It's feeding and lubricating and lighting the Industrial Revolution. No one knows what it looks like. Uh, even the people who do know won't tell anyone. Melville <laughs> won't tell anyone. You know, look at Cytology, the chapter in the yeah. which is the most barefaced se series of lies anyone has ever told about animals. You know, and it's done for the sense of, of, of analogy and art in a way. Because he's harking back to that period. So, he, so could you say that the, uh, in some odd way, the, the uh, hunted whale oil went all over the country, and now the whale-watched whales, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, ha the, the intellectual part of it well, has the, uh, spread I, I, across the country? The song of the whale goes around the world. 
Yeah. And, but what Carol says is very, it's, it's an incredibly important point about whale watching. What does that represent now? And you know, there are places in the world, Carol knows much more than anyone in this room, where that is the new dangerous interface. Like yeah. places like Sri Lanka, where there's a new population, newly yeah. discovered population, very anthropocentric, you know, and centric rather, the, the, this notion that there's these new populations of animals. Right, animals. as though they were never there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know. We didn't know them, we, so they weren't there. Yeah, so now we can exploit them anew by observing them, and what you observe, you destroy. Right. No, but it's a mess. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to, to hear from the panel just in terms of how, um, obviously, um, the economic value of uh, whales and their whale oil, the transition to synthetic oil from, I believe, crude oil, um, and then at what point, you know, people's perceptions about, you know, whales and their sentience and their capacity to think, whether that it's all going on at the same time or at different times. Well, you could speak oil about. was discovered in 1859, Titusville, Pennsylvania, in further west. <coughs> but, so that was the beginning of the end, I believe, and I, I'm sure Bob knows more about this than I do. <coughs> but the whole business about caring about the whales, I think, was generations later. But I'll, I'll let you pick that up. Um, a couple of things happening to put them all in order here. So. Um, you had mentioned earlier about you know all these all these pilot whales coming up on shore. There was a company called. It started off as Nye Oil, yeah. And much of what they did was based on whales that had beached themselves, and they had teams set up along the from Massachusetts down to Georgia, waiting for whales to beach themselves, and they'd run out, and cut off all their heads, and take out all the melon oil and. You know, all these toothed whales have partially hollow jaws as part of the part of their, their adaptation for um, receiving sounds when they echolocate. Create it here, receive it here. For us, it's created here, <coughs> receive it here. And they take out the oil out of this hollow part of the jaw. And, you know, much, much of what they did for 100, and, they started in the 1840s, went on through the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act passing in 1972. They were told then, whatever you have on your shelves, you can sell it, you can use it, but once those shelves are empty, that's it. And even in the 60s, they had started working on synthetics because it was harder and harder to get the whale oil. So now, Nye Lubricants is still a very viable business. They don't do the stuff Exxon and all these others do. They do niche market stuff. So radio dials in your car, there's a couple of drops of oil in there so, it, so they don't stick. That's the stuff they make. You know, they have stuff on NASA satellites now. So you had that. Um, going to the part about 1859, Edwin Drake finding oil in Titusville, Titusville, PA. A lot of the people that had worked in the whale oil industry were tapped to help these people right. refine petroleum. Mm -hmm. So they took Incredible the knowledge <laughs> and and maybe I'm going a little off here from what you asked, but that discovery, spring steel being invented in mm. 1906, mm. corsets going out of fashion in 1910, those three things mm. saved a lot of whales. Yeah. Yeah. The Transcontinental Railroad, the um, gold rush, made it, hard, made it harder and harder for whale merchants, agents, to find people to work on the ships. Right. So they changed over from you know, they changed to these gaff rigged setups so you could have fewer people on board while the rest of the guys were in the boats chasing after the whales. So there are a lot of things that happened economically that saved whales. But it, 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 the, the change of consciousness in the 50s and 60s and 70s that woke a lot of us up had to do with the audio, had to do with just realizing we were, we were doing horrible things and killing off a lot of whales in a very short period of time. Yeah. But how ironic that the whale saw us into the Anthropocene yeah. Yeah. and that the, the, it was the, the, the exchange of whale oil for mineral oil which has completely 
created this new apocalypse. It's petroleum-based oil. Exactly. Yeah. That, it's so ironic, you know. So, 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 do, so are you are you advocating a return? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you I know doubt the, it. You know, the, you know the Iceland whaling entrepreneur. I can't remember his name. Dave will know. John, Johnson. Johnson. Claims he's found the, the ultimate eco oil to fuel his whaling boats. Whale oil. <laughs> you know, there's one other factor, though. Uh, I think. Especially in the days of sailing vessels, whales were "quote unquote" commercially extinct. I mean, it just—it was too hard to get a good catch. They go out longer and farther and farther, and then the trouble getting crews because of better opportunities on land. Um, so that too, it was a victim of its own success uh, in the 19th century. Well, I was going to let that play out, but the, the, your second part of your question, I, there's something that I, hasn't been said that I think I think played a really big role here in Provincetown. It's that kind of generated, to Philip's point about, uh, and expanded out around the world. And that was when we traded looking through the sights of a harpoon gun to looking through a camera and, and recognizing unique individuals animals yes. and ah, keeping track yes. of individual animals yes. with different yes. oh they they're slightly different this one is very curious this one likes to jump this one, you know that that it was starting in other places but it really grew here in Provincetown with the combination of the center and the whale watch so that this keeping track of individuals and the naming <coughs> The naming, personalizing, personalizing yeah. salt and pepper. Yeah. We started doing that around the yeah. world. I did the whale naming in Greenland. There's some very interesting <laughs> names, <laughs> but but that I think uh, was also played. I mean, the the song was that sort of hit a global wave. But I th but I think this this keeping track of individual animals, and when I go around the, around the world now and talk about the uh, studying humpback whales. They look at the data set here in the in the center on, on this 30, 40 years of knowing individuals and their offspring and all of that as as unbelievable and remarkable and uh, and it does uh, change people's perspective definitely just even if they're not in Canada. Phil, can you fill us in a little bit about the recent you know the strandings in England? Well, the mass strandings of the just a little. Well, it's, I, I, for any of you, I'm sure you know that the, in the North Sea in January, it, uh, uh, a total of 29 sperm whales stranded, um, which has actually been added to since another uh, couple was stranded um, uh, 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 two two weeks ago of Holland. Um, uh, 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 it's the, and I think this again speaks to this this the, the scientific input that that um, that. Um, <coughs> You know the, the sequence of events that leads to these animals' death is is on the scale of a Greek tragedy. You know uh, these animals, which are driven. We don't know why this particular pod of sperm whales, young male sperm whales, were driven into the shallow North Sea, but they can't feed there because they, you know, they, they feed at great depths. Uh, sperm whales, and as we know, whales get their fresh water from the food they eat. You know, the, in the case of sperm whales, it's squid, 90% of their diet is squid. And, and so these animals are suffering dehydration before they are, you know, um, are starving. The dehydration puts a, a, a stress on their, on their immune system. At the, 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 uh, uh, that point, the adipose fat starts to break down and the PCBs and the heavy metals and everything else that we pump into the ocean, the North Sea being one of the most polluted seas in the world, um, then start to break down and additionally impact their health. And so it's like this concatenation of, of, of the, uh, again, the thing that we l l lay on these animals because of their invisibility, because beneath what Melville called the ocean skin, you know, we believe that, you know, we don't actually believe or, or think about what's going on below there, the, 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 you know, the, the changes that we're making to it. So these animals become kind of like modern emblems of pathos, you know. And I've read scientific papers about sperm whale, uh, mass sperm whale stranding in, in, the, in, the, in the Mediterranean, I think in 2011, in one of Hal Whitehead's um, papers, um, or, or published by uh, 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 his peers. Uh, and the word, it, it, it really leapt out of a scientific paper, the word, they lay agonizing on the shore. Yeah. And it was like something out of Aeschylus, you know. Uh, 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 and, and it's this 
And the, I think this is what story you're saying about, and David as well, about the notion of how science, and Carol very much, is that the sense of what science now has to do, it kind of has to come out of its corner, in a way. And I think that's what the centre do, amazingly. I think that's what New Bedford, where anyways, I mean, the publication of, I mean, one of the stand first amazing papers of recent years, in a way, has been Bob's paper about the number of great whales that were killed, the, the sheer removal of that biomass from the ocean. Again, you know, the notion that the removal of those whales actually has contributed to climate uh, change because whale poo is a fertilizer. The removal of that poo has meant, you know, uh, an additional... Um, whale but, but Yeah, and whale carcasses, exactly, exactly. So it seems to me it's extraordinary how the, it all comes down to this, this kind of poetic um, animal that changes shape according to what we want it to be. You know, it becomes what we determine it to be. We name it. Well, I want to start a campaign to rename all whales. Humpback whale. Sorry, this beautiful, exquisite, <laughs> baroque creature that's swimming out there. We saw them today. Humpback whale. It's Quasimodo. <laughs> Sperm whale. Because they thought it was the okay, whale's spunk coming out of his head. I'm sorry, this is offensive. <laughs> is it not? You know, the right whale. Because it was the right whale to kill. You know, so the the language is important here. It's it, you know, there are the it's the carrier of our meaning and of our attitudes. You know, so the notion and the notion of these whales dying in the North Sea, which was covered all around the world. You know. These pathetic, deflated creatures lying slumped on the silt in, off the Netherlands coast and the, the naughty coast of England and Germany, you know, what, what do they bear of our, of our sort of our, of our griefs, of our disconnection with nature? You know, the things that Dennis and I see when we go on beach walks to Herring Cove. <coughs> You know, the, 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 the kind of interface that you enjoy. I mean, you are in a very, all you people in this room are in a very privileged population and, uh, and position. You know, how many people in the world have a sensibility of the natural world in that way? Have, have that, can, can take the temperature of the climate daily, you know? The way that you go through the seasons, you feel the seasons here. Most people don't feel this. The only way people feel the seasons is in the microclimate of their cars as they go to work. <laughs> That's their only interface with the natural world during the day. They ignore the birds above their head. You know, they ignore, ignore what goes. They turn, we phys most people physically turn our backs to the sea. You know, we fly over continents, we don't, if we're over oceans, we don't even look out the window <coughs> what's going on below us, you know. <laughs> Question back there. Uh, Me, comment. I'd just like to make a comment. Um, you were talking about Jane Goodall and the, the uh, chimpanzees, and it just seems to me that Jane Goodall is a wonderful public relations person for chimps, and I was thinking Stormy Mayo is, is our public relations person for whales. I, let me and tell you, And how can I've we met Jane do Goodall this? Jane Goodall, and I'm no Jane Goodall. <laughs> <laughs> this is a political season. <laughs> Good. Sir? On the subject of entanglement, uh, some years back, uh, two of the Kennedy boys, uh, nephews of our late president, uh, John Kennedy, were out sailing in uh, near Tucket Sound. They came across a whale that was entangled, mm -hmm. and they proceeded to uh, they proceeded to be in pain, and they proceeded to free it. I mm -hmm. think as a result of that, maybe Stormy's familiar with it. I'm sure he is. Uh, they were charged, as I recall, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, chastised and everything else. And I'm wondering. Does anybody have any comment on that? I'm sure. I'm sure. I got all the good ones. I got the good ones. Um, I, I actually don't know the, the real specific, the, the specific specifics of that, but I do know that that globally, there's a lot of misinformation out there um, on, you know, our our friends YouTube and the social media, and most of it has to do with. Uh, uh, when you, if you Google or, or search for social media on rescuing entangled whales, you're not going to get 
professional rescue is done safely, carefully, and properly, you're going to get these the feel good ones and where someone jumped in the water with a knife and and you're not going to get the ones where the guy jumped in the water and never came out, you know, which has happened. Um, so so it's 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 a real struggle because those of us that are trying to um, get uh, correct information out often come up against a really great feel good story where it fortunately it went well. You know, but then we have to say, well, that, that that's that's really great, but you know, there was a chance, a higher chance, you could have been killed than if you had called, you know, the center and someone would have come down. And Is there a statute that prohibits a, uh, a sure. citizen? Yeah. From yes. Yeah. 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 But 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 there, but there's a, but there's something else to say in addition to the safety of the people and the. Yes. Uh, yeah. The doing it right means the animal is cleaned of gear and the gear is returned and analyzed, which helps us develop methods to keep them from getting tangled again. But a lot of the efforts, and it's the reason, one of the main reasons that, that, that they restrict people, uh, just amateurs going out there and doing it, is because very often they don't cut the, cut the gear off properly and the whales are left eventually to die in the remnants nice. and a longer so there's an attempt yeah. I don't think they ever really prosecute anybody but there's an attempt to try to try to do it a different way which is to get people who who see a whale like that to stand by so that groups like the center's rescue team that he and I are no longer part of. Um, well, I'm still well, you're sort of. We're honorary. <laughs> yeah, honorary. But it's a, it, it, it is that it needs to be done right. It's been pretty clear that between people getting killed and whales dying because it hasn't been done right, um, it does look beautiful when it succeeds, but it doesn't succeed you know, that mo often. Most of the, I, I'm of the belief now, based on all the information we've gathered over 30 years, that many of the free swimming entanglements that we deal with here were are the result of someone cutting it short you know the whale may have been anchored alive at the surface but somebody may have cut it and said well it swam off it's okay but instead the tight wraps are still there and the whale is dying uh, the average time to death is six months uh -huh. hey, can i say one thing because i think it should be said that um Disentanglement, if in, in case anyone in this room thinks disentanglement is solving the problem, it's a band-aid on a gaping wound. And uh, it is a, a, a wonderful work they do around the world, saving individual wh wh whales, and, and we care about individual whales, but the problem yes. is so far beyond that, if, so if let an expert talk if about If I can address it. that, because Please. When, when, we, when we gathered here in Provincetown, all the heads of di rescue disentanglement networks around the world, there, w there weren't many of them because there wasn't many networks at the time, but um, the underdeveloped countries were saying, we want capacity building in this, we want to rescue whales. And frankly, all of us said, why? This is not the answer. Um, we are only, we know even with the, here in, in, the, in the Gulf of Maine with all these whale watchers and researchers and everybody reporting, we probably are lucky if we get one out of ten entangled whales. The rest are just never, never seen. But what we realized and what is an essential part of our, we have a international best practices, is what Stormy said. The, we, we use the opportunity to collect information and we are slowly gathering information from these entangled whales that will lead towards prevention because prevention is the it's 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 the only thing that makes sense for the fishermen too and for the whales yeah. um, just so everyone knows um, we're gonna take one more question after this because it's 7 30 I don't or maybe three more questions um, <laughs> but there is a closure to lobster fishing in Cape Cod Bay while the right whales in theory, are are in the area. So, in other words, we tr are, there are management processes in place to try to minimize um, some of that entanglement. Yes. However, this afternoon, uh, <laughs> our aerial survey team saw five mother calf pairs in the bay. So it's becoming a nursery ground. The newborn calves Does that are have down. To do with warmer water. Who knows? But the important thing is that the Division of Marine Fisheries is starting to consider continuing the closure because of those mother calf pairs. So in Cape Cod Bay, we're in pretty good shape. 
What about the entire rest of the world's oceans? Yeah. That's and, and actually, the, the, the IWC is going to, I'm, day after tomorrow, I'm going to a workshop on on the welfare of aspects of entanglement and stranding where they're going to try to, the stranding world is going to try to, to develop best practices like we have for the entanglement so that, that everybody, so that's not, you're not dragging them out by the tail if they're yeah, not going to yeah. make it, that kind of thing. There's but, a couple of questions I don't want to, I yeah. don't want to lose track of, so. Um, Jan and Anna. Yeah, I just, David, further to your intent, the entanglement versus whaling thing, I think it's important to point out that um, you've mentioned a couple of times entanglement nowadays is, is just as bad, if not worse, as far as um, the threat The estimate is 300,000 uh, cetaceans die every year right. from, from bycatch and entanglement. And, and that's and a slow death. Yeah. And it's a slow death, and, it's, and, and whaling today is very, very strictly regulated as to species, whereas entanglement, Good there's point. no regulation as to species. It's Good all point. totally accidental. So you have very, very uh, threatened whales, like uh, North, North Atlantic right whale being entangled and killed, whereas it's, it's absolutely verboten to, to, to do whaling on North Atlantic right whales. So that, that's why entanglement is just so awful. The reason I did a training in Oman is because the Arabian Sea humpback population, thanks to this illegal Soviet whaling, is the last estimate is 86 animals in the, in the Arabian Sea humpback population. So, and almost all of them have previous wounds from entanglement. Mm -hmm. Anna had a question. Oh, I just to bring it from the perspective of the whale, I understand they live more than a hundred years. So would the whales have experienced whaling and you I don't know well, I see the math. Is so would a whale have experienced whaling and now the so, great some question. have bowhead whales um, live apparently uh, some may be pushing two hundred and, and they know that because because one that was killed by the Alaskans had a had a uh, 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 primitive uh, yeah. harpoon yeah. 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 in the, in the yeah. But um, the humpbacks, uh, actually the, the center has worked with scientists in Tasmania to de develop an aging technique. And the, right now, I, if I understand correctly, there's not any that are over 50 to 60 years old. So the humpbacks don't, but may not right live as long. Maybe. Right whales, we have so, uh, so some maybe and some other folks not. Yes, it's oh, I'm sorry, he's been here. He's hand up for a while. <laughs> hey, we, you know, we would, uh, I don't know how late the library is, but I'll, I'll be happy to talk with people yeah. even the after The library director sleeps here all night. So everybody get out by eight. So, the, so uh, well, eight. People, people should leave who have to go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But please. I, I wanted to ask, because um, I, I really enjoy whale watches, and I've done quite a few. But I, as it gets to be the thing of the day, how, how is it, is it being monitored at all as to numbers? Is it go, could it become the new entertainment and um, as the places in Florida or wherever they were, were? Is there any, is there any, um, well, I, I can, I any can give you the politically there. correct answer and that is, there's a program called Whale Sense, which is a cooperative uh, venture by all the commercial whale watch uh, 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 businesses. They've gotten together, they've listened to people like Carol and, and, and Stormy, and uh, we have a best practices uh, to, to minimize disturbance. The goal is not to harass whales, not to influence their behavior in any way, uh, and uh, that's the poli politically correct answer. The reality is, uh, you know, I don't know. There are a lot of whale watch boats out there, and uh, we all have our misgivings. It's, it's a balance between sharing these animals with so many people and them getting something out of it, and then hopefully we're not affecting them. Um, but that's a tough. But, but look, uh, there's, there's, there's one thing that, uh, that I think has to be said, and that is that all of us entering the sea in present day vessels exactly. are creating a noise environment yeah. that increasingly, right. mm -hmm. and I think you're going to hear about this much more yeah. in the next decade, we're beginning to realize that we're insonifying the ocean mm -hmm. and disrupting 
the ecosystem in ways that that may be greater than than extreme noise on the land disrupts our lives because most of these animals including whales are are probably more using using their auditory sense more than they are using a lot of their other senses after all like whales can't in here in this environment can't see their tails they're using sound uh, Chris Clark, if you heard the talk that was given at Nappies just recently at, by the center, uh, Chris uh, is the on the forefront of that. He's a Truro re uh, resident and now a collaborator at the lab, maybe doing a lot of work at the lab. And so when you get on a boat, and I might include research vessels, by the way, <laughs> including tomorrow when we go out, we're going to insonify the environment of the North Atlantic right whale clinging to the very and edge humpbacks. of extincts. And, yeah. humpbacks. and humpbacks, but we don't look at humpbacks yeah. on the boat. <laughs> 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 Carol, Carol wants to add something. Well, only that there's no regulation here. You know, we have, we have guidelines, and they're voluntary guidelines, and we adhere to them through this Whale Sense program. We promise to be good stewards of our environment. But if you go out on a summer weekend, which I refuse to do, <laughs> you'll see whale watch boats, but you'll see hundreds and hundreds of other small boats. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And the reality yes. is that the level of boat strikes, small propeller marks on whales, is significantly increasing. Mm -hmm. And you have sports fishing vessels. We have a shipping lane that runs right through Stellwagen Bank. So there's no shortage of sound out there. There are just hundreds and hundreds of boats out there every single summer. There are countries that have been very prescriptive about it. Um, Chile got in regulations before they had whale watching started in certain areas. And Brazil and other countries, you know, these uh, supposedly third world countries have very strict regulation. But implementation's really hard and enforcement's really hard. But, you know, we're hoping, we've been trying to get regulation here since 1984. And that includes the whale watch companies. We went to a meeting to try to get regs, um, and we just don't have them. Uh, and John, John had, had one to follow up. Uh, I just let me let me just say, I think this has gone long and it's been fun for me, and I assume for the rest of us. Uh, and we we're going to stay here, but uh, why don't we take a break? And anybody who wants to come up and talk with us or sit around and gap about it, do it, but it's, it has been a long, long time. Do you want to say anything, Laura? Just uh, anyone who does want to be um, on the library's Facebook page saying, call me Ishmael, please uh, stop at their uh, desk on the way out, because they do want to get your um, your, your face on their uh, page. So we're, we're going to take a break.